wrong way. Um, my name's Andrew. My background's mainly in programming in the mining industry. Um, I got a little bit bored without doing any uni work, so I decided to go back and do a PhD in biomechanics. Um, I've got a computer science degree and a couple of engineering degrees. I love study. Um, so going from doing visualization and data analysis, I thought I'd do something a bit different. Um, my research is really around uh, head injuries, and there's 600,000 people uh, in Australia that are, are suffering from some sort of brain injury. Uh, 22,000 of those are annually from traumatic brain injuries, and that's from accidents and falls. Um, so it's definitely an area that we need to be paying a bit more attention to. Um, we already can simulate head traumas, but the big problem we have is that we don't understand the bounds of what the problem is. So they'll quite often just look at one subject, um, so my research is around looking at how we can expand what research has already been done to the entire population. So looking at uh, age and gender and ethnicity, uh, just so that we can, whatever work we do, we can then look at how we can apply it. Um, I'm still in the very early stages of my PhD, so a lot of this stuff here is forward looking. Um, but yeah, I'll know more in a couple of years. Um, so the first part of my research is really around uh, a single subject and trying to move through acquiring the data building a model on the computer, cleaning that up so we can do some processing, running simulations on that model, and then looking at the results to see what we find. Uh, once I get through that, then I flesh it out a bit more with more patients, um, varying their age, gender, and ethnicity, uh, looking at how I can automate some of that process of building the model, and then processing that. Uh, then also the simulation, I need to look at more than just frontal impacts, I need to look at every which way that a uh, an impact can occur and some of the more complicated things like clustering and grid technologies because of the huge amount of data I'll be dealing with and then looking at the results around what the best case and worst case is for these simulations and how that varies across the ethnic groups and age and gender. So the ways that we can acquire data for this sort of information, there's a number of ways. We've got standard x-rays, the problem with that is it only gives you a two-dimensional view, not really useful for a simulation. We can go to CTs, still using x-rays. We can use PET, which uses um, a, a contrasting material and it detects uh, radio radiation from that. Uh, the problem with those first three um, eye options is they use what's called ionizing radiation and that's what can lead to cancer. So to avoid that, th my focus is on MRI technology, which is, unless you have some sort of metal inside your body, pretty safe. Um, so it's also readily available. Most hospitals, if not all hospitals, will have access to at least one MR um, machine. Um, some of the challenges are that because of the sort of technology it uses, it can't detect bone. Obviously with sort of structural um, things, the stiffer materials like the bone are the more important materials. So that's one of the challenges I'm working to overcome. And obviously there's a certain cost. So when I'm looking at doing a large population, that's going to cost a lot of money to actually run those scans. Um, so the first part of building a model is we've got our data from the MR and that stores it in what's called voxels, which are just three-dimensional pixels. So instead of just being a, uh, a height and a width, they've also got a depth. Uh, so we then convert that to a 3D model and that gives us a represent representation in 3D space. We then need to process that model and get useful information embedded into the model. Um, so that's things like cleaning up the artifacts because that will give us errors. Uh, we need to smooth off the edges so that we don't get um, uh, bad data coming out of our simulation. And we also need to understand the different layers of material uh, in that uh, skull that we've just scanned. So as you can see in that diagram, there's a number of different layers and that's a fairly simplified version of what there is. Um, so when we want to actually do the simulation, we use what's called the finite element method, which we've been using in engineering for probably about 40 years. Um, the good thing is now that we've got faster computers, we can do it with bigger models with more detail. Um, so th just to simplify the way that we do, do that is we break up a very complicated model and we break it up in tiny little bricks, uh, probably about one millimetre cubed, and we then look at what happens to that brick and then we combine that with every other brick and normally you're talking about, say, about a quarter of a million to a million elements that you've got to break up and then join in software. Um, some of the other complexities we've got are collisions. That's pretty hard to simulate using this sort of method. Uh, and then also things like when materials don't behave uh, in a, what's called a linear fashion. So things like um, the brain, that doesn't 
uh, respond like the beams in the roof would respond to forces. Um, and the other big problem is that it takes a long time to run these simulations. Uh, it's not unreasonable to have these sort of simulations running for three weeks at a time or more. Um, so after you've done your hours or days or weeks of number crunching, you'll get something like this. Um, this is obviously from another paper that I've been reading heavily. Um, and that'll tell you the stress distribution across the skull, uh, across the brain. Obviously, we're looking at the entire skull, but that's just a, a brain for you. So what we need to know is where the, the, the stresses on the brain are too high, because um, that will cause damage to the tissue. If it's on the skull, that will cause a fracture, um, and that will give us the, um, an understanding of what forces are too much for different people to handle. Uh, we can then correlate that with what we know. So we've already got crash test data uh, um, for motor vehicle safety, so we can use that information to kind of correlate what we're doing here. And there's also many other studies that we can use to make sure that the numbers we're getting out are reasonable and that our results are valid. Uh, the big technical challenges is really just around the volume of data and the volume of processing. So we have many, many patients. Each patient needs to have many, many simulations run on, run on them, and each simulation takes many, many days to run. So that's why we need to use things like clusters and grid computing. Thankfully, the uni's got a good cluster, and there's also a nice research cluster um, at ANU, I believe. Um, yeah, and there's lots of data to manage, so transferring that across our, uh, our internet is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so our goals are really around trying to understand the variation. So we know that we can do this work, but we need to understand how that can vary across the population. We need to understand where the peak risks occur, uh, particularly around um, particular groups. So, for instance, side impacts are quite a, a risky um, sort of impact for head trauma. So we need to understand what age group and gender group and ethnic group um, are most at risk uh, and where there's special care needed to specific groups. So already we have special helmets, special restraints for kids, uh, we need to understand what's appropriate based on the data, not just a rule of thumb. Uh, and this, uh, this work will allow us to make better decisions around our future simulations. So we don't need to do it for uh, 100 patients. We can do it for one, and then we can apply that over the population based on uh, the sort of stuff that I work out. And it also means if the generic safety equipment's applicable. At the moment in the mines, they issue everyone the same sort of hard hat. Maybe that's not appropriate. Maybe it is. That's what I'm going to try and find out. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, right here. Um